Coming up next on KPBS Evening Edition, for the first time in three years, cities and schools are finally getting a little good news from the county tax collector. The property, property tax roll is growing again, and are you paying more for water, but actually using less? The San Diego Water Authority says you're paying too much, and they're suing the agency in charge of water rates. KPBS Evening Edition starts now. Hello, thanks for joining us. I'm Joanne Ferrian. And I'm Dwayne Brown. San Diego-based Diego sailors and Marines have arrived in the Persian Gulf region just as tensions are building with Iran. The two groups of San Diego Navy ships are now stationed in the Middle East. The USS Carl Vinson arrived today with its carrier group just days after Iranian officials threatened to close the Strait of Hormuz. The Navy says the Carl Vinson will support Operation Enduring Freedom. Also in the area is the USS Macon Island, the Navy's newest amphibious assault ship on her maiden voyage. The 11th Marine Expeditionary Unit from Camp Pendleton is with the Macon Island Group. The Carl Vinson arrived as Iran announced a death sentence for a former Camp Pendleton Marine. The Iranian government convicted Amir Marai Hekmati as a CIA spy. Hekmati was a military translator with dual U.S. and Iranian citizenship. He had been visiting his grandmother in Iran when he was arrested. The U.S. says he is not a spy, and the State Department has demanded his release. This is the first time an American has been sentenced to death in Iran since the Islamic Revolution in 1979. Opening arguments began today in a long-awaited trial at Camp Pendleton, that of a Marine sergeant, for the deaths of 24 Iraqis, including unarmed women and children in the town of Haditha. KPBS reporter Allison St. John has been following today's proceedings. She joins us now by phone. Now, Allison, this is the biggest criminal case against U.S. troops in the Iraq War. Staff Sergeant Frank Wooderich is the final Marine to be tried in this case. The others have been acquitted or had their cases dismissed. Now, tell us about opening arguments today. Well, Joanne, the prosecution, which is essentially the government, had fairly short opening arguments, just about half an hour. They uh, cited several of the clips from the 60-minute interview that Wooderich gave back in 2007, which were rather incriminating, in which he said that he did think there were probably women and children in the rooms where he uh, raided. Now, they cited evidence that he told his squad to shoot first, ask questions later, and they gave rather graphic, gory descriptions of the killings in the, in the houses. They concluded by saying that um, Woodridge never lost control of his squad, made a series of fatal assumptions, and did lose control of himself. Now, the defense attorneys, on the other hand, civilian defense attorneys, took more than an hour to describe the scene. They questioned the veracity of the testimony of some of the uh, Marines who are going to be testifying against Woodrich, members of his squad, calling them, quote, a bunch of scared Marines who were offered immunity. They characterized the whole event as unfortunate and tragic and summed up by asking the jury to give Woodrich his life back, put Hadita behind us, and move on. We don't have a lot of time left, Allison, but quickly, there was some speculation last week about whether members of the jury would be experienced in combat situations. Is that the case? Joanne, I think that's a key element of the whole trial. All eight members of the jury have combat experience, and the defense appealed to that combat experience when considering this case. KPBS reporter Allison St. John. A former San Diego City Councilman has lost his last bid to avoid prison time for extortion, fraud and conspiracy. The U.S. Supreme Court has rejected an appeal by Ralph Nzunza. He was convicted in 2005 of conspiring with a Las Vegas lobbyist to get rid of rules that barred customers at strip clubs from touching dancers. He was sentenced to 21 months and is expected to begin serving that sentence soon. San Diego Chargers are staying put for at least another season. They've been working with the city for 10 years now on building a new football stadium. Today, the team vowed to keep working on a plan to pay for it. Attorney Mark Fabiani is special counsel to the San Diego Chargers. He says all over California, it's very difficult to get major projects like a football stadium going. No football team in L.A. or Orange County for 17 years. Old stadium in San Francisco, old stadium in Oakland, old stadium in San Diego. He says whether you're a sports fan or not, you should be concerned about the ongoing costs to operate Qualcomm Stadium. And the first thing that's wrong with Qualcomm has nothing to do with football. It's the fact that the city owns 166 acres of land that generates no revenue for the city and in fact costs the taxpayers between 12 and 17 million dollars a year. 
This bus maintenance yard behind me in the East Village could possibly be a site for a Charger football stadium. Fabiani says the team and the city are working on exploring options to finance it. It would be about a punt away from Petco Park. Being competitive with the top teams in the league, allowing us to sign the best players, that's very important to us. And we need a stadium that's competitive with the other stadiums in the league, which means modern luxury boxes, club seats that people want to, to be in, uh, naming rights, sponsorship, electronic signage, all of that goes into the, the picture. Fabiani says a public vote on how to pay for a new stadium may be delayed until the spring of 2013. That would leave the project in the hands of a new mayor but also give the Chargers a chance at a Super Bowl run next season. And those rumors about moving to Los Angeles are off the table for now. It certainly is at this point. I can't predict the future years down the road, but at this point we're committed to staying in San Diego. The Chargers say they want the public to vote on a stadium financing plan in November. However, they're running out of time to broker a deal and get it on the ballot this fall. One other bit of sports business news tonight. The sale of the Padres is expected to be completed on Thursday. A group led by former sports agent Jeff Morad has been buying into the franchise since 2009. And Major League Baseball says the group has fully paid off previous majority owner John Moores. All that's left is for the league's owners to approve the deal. That could pave the way for a San Diego version of Fox Sports Prime ticket. It's already on the air in L.A. and Arizona. Cities and schools may be finally catching a break in the economy. Joanne has more on how the county tax roll is growing again at the KPBS Evening Edition Roundtable. The numbers are in. San Diegans paid more in property taxes in 2011 than the year before. Perhaps bad news if you're a homeowner, but good news if you're a city which relies on those taxes to balance your budget. Joining me to break down the numbers is San Diego County Treasurer and Tax Collector Dan McAllister. Thanks for being here. Thank you very much for having me. Let's start with the big picture. How much money in property taxes did the county collect last year? $4.54 billion, a $66 million increase over the previous year. And that is a good sign. That is something that has enabled us to believe that we're starting to see the light at the end of the tunnel uh, in many of our communities. Things are starting to look a little brighter. So does that mean that property values are going up, they're changing hands more often, or, or what does it mean? I think overall it means that property values uh, are going up. It means that they do continue to change hands. Just because properties change hands doesn't necessarily mean the value goes up, especially if people are buying uh, homes that were in foreclosure or uh, out there as distressed properties. So we're starting to see things push up, and that's a good sign. And this really reverses a trend of the past couple of years. I know I've done some reporting on this that last year, in fact, for the first time in more than 30 years, the rate of inflation pushed down property assessments. So this this is really a reversal, isn't it? Over yes, it the past is. Few years? Yes, it is. And it's based, as the assessor always tells us, on the California Consumer Price Index, which sadly for San Diegans is based on the indices of Los Angeles and San Francisco counties. So when they're up, we're up. And it shows that there is a little bit of an improvement over the zero line, which is what we passed through as we came out of the doldrums that we were in for a couple of years. Now, people aren't generally happy about paying more in taxes, but in this case, where does this money go? Gosh, the money goes to cities, it goes to schools, it goes to, in the past, redevelopment. Uh, it goes to a whole myriad of things that are valuable and vital to the operation and function of communities. You mentioned redevelopment. About 11% of this money typically goes to redevelopment. That's not going to, is it going to happen this year? Now we know the Supreme Court has said it's, these agencies will be dissolved. It's a giant question mark. Uh, uh, people are saying that possibly the legislature will swoop in and do something in an omnibus way to replace or replenish what was lost. Uh, some suggest that certain counties or cities may take it upon themselves to come up with a new agency or a new structure to figure out this whole uh, paradigm of redevelopment. Uh, but there's so much up in the air, I don't think anybody can say with preciseness which uh, option will be followed. So has anyone from the state told you or your department, because you're really in charge, aren't you, of making sure this money goes where it's supposed to? Actually, the auditor controller oh, okay. is the one that's the final dispersal entity at the county of San Diego for those monies that are taken in. Uh, and really, I, I think if you look at that 10.7 percent figure of the total tax dollars taken in, it's roughly about $419 million. So it's a huge amount of money that was previously distributed to agencies and entities throughout San Diego County alone. 
it's much more if you add it up statewide. I want to talk a little bit about refunds because that was one of the mm -hmm. reasons that the county had sort of been in that downward trend mm -hmm. in terms of collecting less money. Mm -hmm. What did refunds look like this year? You know, it's, it's intriguing that this past year in 2011, uh, we sent out about 100 fewer refunds, but for a little more money. Uh, in other words, $17,682,000 were sent back in refunds to people who had had their properties reassessed, uh, possibly some transactional things had occurred, and the properties in the eyes of the assessor were not worth as much as they were previously. They were given what are called negative supplemental bills. Now, there's always a good positive side to getting a negative supplemental bill, and that's called a check. The check <laughs> arrives, and it's, it's money that seems to pour from somewhere, uh, and it's very positive uh, for the people that receive them. Now, aren't there people, aren't there sort of refunds that go unclaimed as well, money that you don't, can't find the owner? There really are, and it's kind of sad to us, but, and people say, well, gosh, how could you not find the owner of uh, property tax revenues or refunds? Uh, but a lot of reasons. Uh, we had a case about two years ago. Uh, we received a frantic call from a reporter from a, a local newspaper who said, gosh darn it, this lady deserves a refund. We agreed. We researched it. Uh, she did. Uh, as it moved through the processes of the assessor's office, we were able to get a check, cut it, send it. Six weeks later, I get another call saying, where's the money? The money hasn't shown up. Well, it turned out the woman had failed to pay her postal box fee at the post office, and they sent it back as undeliverable. So it's up to individual property owners to refer the assessor to new addresses or address changes or things of that sort. In that case, there was nothing anybody could do. I finally went out on a weekend and presented the check. It, it gave me a good feeling. It felt a little like Ed McMahon <laughs> possibly presenting a sweepstakes. It was almost $2,000. She was wow. very pleased to get the money. Quickly before we go, is there a website people can go to find out if any of this unclaimed money is theirs? Absolutely. It's uh, www.sdtreastax.com. Great, Dan McAllister, thanks so much for being here. My pleasure indeed. Thank you and Happy New Year. As if the long lines weren't reason enough to try to avoid the DMV, Governor Brown is offering another incentive. We'll tell you about that in a moment. This is KPBS Evening Edition. Tonight on KPBS at 8, Antiques Roadshow is in Tulsa, Oklahoma, checking out the vintage Petroleana collectibles and an extremely rare 1924 Lloyd Lore mandolin. Then at 9, the Roadshow moves to Tampa, Florida to peruse a range of golf collectibles, also breastplate decorations from a Sioux chief. And at 10, Michael Palin reaches the second highest mountain in the world in his trek across the Himalayas. That's tonight on KPBS. I'm Jeffrey Brown. On the next news hour, Gwen Eiffel reports from New Hampshire a day ahead of the primary, plus Supreme Court arguments over redistricting in Texas. That's Monday on the PBS News Hour. The American people have named PBS the most trusted source of news and public affairs for the eighth year in a row. Trust. The American people have spoken. Thank you. KPBS Evening Edition is made possible by Joan and Irwin Jacobs and by Governor Jerry Brown's new budget offers a proposed discount for drivers. $5 off for renewing your vehicle registration online or through the mail instead of going to the Department of Motor Vehicles. The governor says keeping people out of DMV offices would save the state money, but wouldn't say just how much. Drivers, however, are expected to save an estimated $100 million a year with the discount program. Looks like little relief at, looks like a little bit of relief at the gas pump, but it may be short-lived. Gas prices actually fell today after 17 days of increases. The average for a gallon of regular in the county is about $3.70. Today's price drop may be a temporary reprieve. Some industry analysts say retailers haven't caught up with the higher costs. And you may notice something different about the North County Coaster as it passes. Advertisements. Since December, some trains have been literally wrapped in ads by different clients, including UCSD. The North County Transit District charges as much as $200,000 for each billboard. 
Some ads are off limits, no alcohol, no cigarettes, and no off-color messages. Baby boomers continue to wash over America's cultural landscape even as they enter their golden years. The sheer force of numbers gave the post-World War II generation the power to change society for decades. KPBS business reporter Eric Anderson looks at boomers who are putting off retirement's promise of a life of leisure. See what I did? Notice the back is straight. I'm not leaning. I'm not pulling this way. Bill Moore is a teacher with a champion's pedigree. All right, one, good. Get my ten. Two. Moore won bodybuilding competitions in his 40s and 50s. That got the former Marine's picture on the wall of Stern's gym in North Park. He's still working at 70. You can only play golf sometimes so long. You can only fish so long when it becomes boring. And then when it becomes boring, what are you going to do? Three. Moore wants to stay active. Life has been good, but not so good that he can quit working. Last one. I have savings. Uh, I never had a pension, so I've got to continue. As long as I can walk, talk, breathe, I'm going to be working. But that's not the important thing. The most important thing, I love what I do. Moore is part of a growing segment of America's aging population. The Pew Research Center says a quarter of the people living past retirement age are still part of the workforce. Nearly half are working because they need the money. San Diego State University professor emeritus Tom Warshower says the economy gets some of the credit. We wouldn't see that phenomenon if it wasn't for the, for the recent market downturns and lack of growth in the last five years. That's backed up in a new Wells Fargo poll. A quarter of middle-class Americans say they'll need to work until they're 80 in order to be comfortable in retirement. Nearly three-quarters of those polled say they expect to work past retirement. And more than half think that they'll have to work past retirement to make ends meet. Warshower says a number of factors are at play, but two of them stand out. First, there's no mandatory retirement age. The net result is that it's entirely the option of, of the individual. Secondly, as I mentioned, life expectancy has gone up substantially. Warshower says people who think they're going to live longer plan to work longer. Richard Schulman is a 71-year-old computer software salesman and consultant. He's sold imaging programs to scores of government agencies interested in fighting wildfires. San Diego County uses one of those systems. Uh, here's an example of 3D. This product, you can get a 3D rotation. It's actually a very dynamic product. It also will print uh, images. It will print whatever's on the screen. It will output them in a computer format to uh, back to headquarters. As the Pew Research Center discovered, just over half of those working past retirement do it because they want to. I, I get the satisfaction of knowing I'm doing a good job, I get lots of feedback, and I seem to be part of the team and needed, and the clients are loyal for that. The retired naval commander says financial planning, a modest lifestyle, and some luck affords him the freedom to decide about work. It's all a matter of resources, it's a matter of desire, and it's what you like to do. My wife tells me, my wife Nita, uh, she always gives me you know, constant feedback and says, you enjoy what you're doing, you don't need to stop, just make sure you're balanced, and I do. Most workers thinking about their retirement want what Schulman has. The Pew Research Center says 60% plan to work for pay after retirement because they want to, 30% to expect to work for pay because they have to. That was Eric Anderson reporting. The population is getting older. The Census Bureau says the number of people living to 90 tripled in the past 30 years. Better health care gets the credit. Our next segment is a little like the tale of David and Goliath. San Diego is fighting the public agency that supplies 70% of the county's water. As Joanne explains, the battle is now playing out in a courtroom. You might have noticed your water bill creeping up over the past few years, despite conservation efforts. A lawsuit challenging that increase, or at least part of the increase, is making its way through the courts. The San Diego Water Authority says water users are charged too much in transportation costs. It's suing the Metropolitan Water District, a Los Angeles-based consortium of 26 water districts and cities, including San Diego. Joining me to talk about the court challenge is Denise Fetter, Senior Public Affairs Manager at the San Diego County Water Authority. Denise, thanks for 
for being here. Thank you. Let's talk about our water bills right now. On average, an urban user pays about $70 a month. Now, that's gone up over the past few years. How much has it gone up? You know, it's gone up roughly about 25%. Um, and of that, about 70% of the increase is due to Metropolitan Water District's charges to San Diego County. So why is that? Why is Metropolitan Water District charging us more for water? Well, San Diego County, our San Diego Water Authority, a number of years ago, secured its own reliable Colorado River supplies for San Diego. And we use MWD's pipes to transport that water. So MWD charges us, but they charge us a lot. And we believe they are charging us way too much for the cost of doing that. And that's one of the drivers behind our water rates. So that, and that's really what your lawsuit is saying, isn't it? Yes, our lawsuit is saying that we should pay something for transporting that water, but we believe that we're being way overcharged. Let me put it in context. Over the next 45 years, we estimate that it's a, up to $1.2 billion that San Diego ratepayers will be overcharged. So tell people at home, what is the Metropolitan Water District? The Metropolitan Water District is a agency in Los Angeles that is governed by the legislature and they um, sell um, imported water, Colorado River water and um, state water project water. And why can't they charge more for transportation? Why can't they say we're going to increase Because it's their against rates? the law. <laughs> it's not, uh, it's against the Constitution, it's against the law. A public agency can't charge more than the cost of service. So we believe that the other MWD agencies have gotten together and unfairly jacked up the transportation rate because San Diego is the only one that has to pay that rate. Okay, and we're also at the end of the pipeline. I want to read a couple of statements uh, from the Metropolitan Water District. We did call them today and they referred us to their website for the following of this, for the following statement. The SDCWA lawsuit seeks to undermine this proven and successful regional approach and replace it with cost shifting strategies that benefit one community over another. Outside of San Diego, there is overwhelming support for Metropolitan's current rate structure which reflects an equitable and regional approach. One more statement. This was from an op-ed piece back in November in the North County Times. Um, and it also comes from Randy Record, who's vice chair of Metropolitan Water District. He says only San Diego is attacking and balking at paying its fair share of costs. MWD's management and the other 25 member agencies are trying to maintain financial arrange arrangements that are fair to all Southern California water cu customers. He says in his opinion, San Diego needs to take that responsibility to heart and examine the fairness of attempting to shift costs to others for its water supply. So it's true, San Diego's the only one complaining about this. How come? Well, that's because we're the only one that, we're the only ones that have our own supply of Colorado River water. And it's not because we're at the end of the pipe, it's because we're using the pipe. It doesn't matter um, if you're at the end of the pipe or not. Um, there's a portion of the pipe that we're using and we want to be charged fairly for that. So, so we're the only ones using the, the pipeline. Ones, so we're the only ones being charged this well, cost. We're the only ones transporting our own supply of water. MWD uses that system to transport its supply and deliver it to member agencies. That is the water supply rate. The transportation rate, which is the one that San Diego pays, is used because we buy water and we need to use their pipes to transport it. So we believe that the other MET member agencies have gotten together and unfairly made that rate higher so they can pay less for the water that's being delivered to them from MWD. So you think we're actually paying more in that rate than the true cost of it? We, are, we, we know we are. We've had studies done. We gave those studies to MWD before we, before we um, did the loss, before we filed suit. And so we have, um, you know, we have studies that show that we are being paid that we are being charged more than the cost of fair and reasonable service. I mean, we don't have a lot that. of time left, but just okay. at the end of the day, when this gets yes. settled, what could it mean for people at home and pay with their water bills currently? Well, you know, water is expensive and it's not going to get any less expensive, but what if San Diego gets a good result in this lawsuit, what it means is by the time it's all said and done, we could get as much as $200 million back to San Diego County to invest in our local supply development uh, projects.
Denise Vetter, thanks so much for being here. Thank you. What does it mean to kill a man? Legend has it he killed 21. A man for each year of his life. Some say he was a ruthless murderer. He was a cop killer. Others, a hero. He was the Robin Hood of New Mexico. The true story of the most wanted man west of the Pecos. An absolute icon of American outlawry. Billy the Kid on American Experience. Tuesday at 9 on KPBS. The fabric of democracy, I think, really has worn very thin. The opposite of poverty is not wealth. The opposite of poverty is justice. Americans have to fight for the American dream. Democracy is not what governments do, it's, it's what people do. This is how we fight back. Moyers and Company. I'm Bill Moyers. Join me Friday nights at 10 on KPBS San Diego. Welcome back to the Public Square on KPBS Evening Edition. As we told you earlier, you've probably noticed your water bill increasing. We'd like to follow up on this and find out whether you've cut back on water use but continue to pay larger bills. Is it the cost of living in a semi-arid climate or do you feel you overpay? The topic already generated a conversation on our website. Dia Lynn writes, the rates go up because revenue goes down when consump consumption goes down and no one in charge of utilities not SDG&E or the water districts want to see consumers benefit from conservation at the risk of losing their profits. Well, do you agree, disagree? Write to me. Let me know. jferian at kpbs.org or follow us on Twitter. And of course, we like it when you like us on Facebook. And now let's go back to the news desk where Dwayne has a recap of tonight's top stories. Opening arguments were heard at Camp Pendleton today in the last court-martial over the killing of 24 Iraqis in Haditha. A military prosecutor says Sergeant Frank Werderich made a series of fatal assumptions and lost control of himself. The defense says the military's case is based on the statements of scared Marines who were promised immunity. And the San Diego Chargers say they're not going anywhere next season. They say they're close to reaching a deal on a downtown stadium site close to Petco Park. You can watch and comment on any of the stories you saw tonight on our website, kpbs.org slash evening edition. Thanks for joining us. You have a great night. We leave you with a look at the forecast.